I'm Diane McIntosh. This is Ted Stock, Riverside Christian Church in Sweet Home. Hi everyone, I'm Casey Holmes and I used to be the volunteer worship leader at Turner Christian Church. Hello Northwest Christian Convention. This is Jim Jessup coming to you from Jessup University in our new nursing lab. Um, our victory is that uh, we're able to share with uh, people in ministry all over the world in um, Africa, in Asia, and uh, right here next to us at places like Camp Koinonia and um, the Oregon Christian Convention. And, uh, really, giving is what holds our people together and gives life to our church. It's just a great blessing. I realized I needed to resign as worship leader as I entered the third trimester of my third pregnancy. I didn't have the energy or the diaphragm to be leading worship on Sunday morning. These are not catatonic students behind me, but they are mannequins that our 40-some nursing students are able to work on and learn and grow. We aren't a very large church, but our giving is enormous. And we have a lot of participation from everyone who goes, and everybody does a little bit. And we weren't sure what we were going to do going into the summer with two pretty significant needs to be filled. But then I saw on the Northwest Christian Network Facebook page that there was a Bushnell student who was interested in children's ministry and music ministry. She was looking for a summer internship, and she lived right here in Turner. Well, about 90% of our budget goes to missions, and uh, we, we find great joy in that, and uh, hope it continues to grow. So our kingdom victory is that the network led us to Grace Brown, and we had a very successful summer of children's programming, and I got to take a break from worship until my daughter was born. God has been so good, over 1,600 students this year. Thank you for your prayers and support. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. God bless you. Good morning, Northwest Christian Convention. Good morning, Northwest Christian Convention. Woo! Good morning, Turner Christian Church. Woo! It's good to be with you this morning. It's good to be with all of you. Um, just before, so I don't miss this, um, we gave you one of our uh, victory videos that was played on Thursday night. Yeah. And um, one of the reasons why I wanted to play that one is because it was the, it featured Turner Christian Church, and I wanted you all to see how, the victory that we offered. And also, it just so happens that Miss Grace Brown is in the building. Um, Grace, can you stand up real quick? Grace is back from South Korea, and she got back on Friday and so wanted to worship with the convention of the church that she's here even though she crossed the international date line like not that long ago. So, welcome Grace. It's good to see you. We are gathered for the final session of the convention. So those of you from Turner Christian Church, the process that's gonna look a little different, this is going to look like a session of the convention. And so we're going to go through um, worship, we're going to go through, uh, we're gonna have an offering, a message, and uh, communion. And for those of you who are here uh, with the convention, it has been such an honor to be with all of you this week. It's been amazing to see all the victories that have been reported to us and also that have happened here on the grounds. And so we are very excited for this final. Are you tired of it? Sue's tired of it. <laughs> We're very excited about this final session of the convention. So I will uh, invite you to stand for this first song from the, our worship team. And this is, uh, I guess, technically a Turner Christian Church original. Um, it's based on a, a popular hymn, but it's a song that makes it very clear why we are gathered here together. Oops, um, can you hear me my phone? Ah, ah. I'm not gonna take a call, it's just my metronome. I was trying to be a good pastor and make sure my phone was somewhere that it wouldn't bug me and I forgot that it's also my metronome.
Dear Father, we are gathered here as a church, as a convention, as your people to worship you, to gather at your table, to hear your word proclaimed, to receive the gift of manna from you. Open our hearts to receive the gift well, to consume it and be consumed by it, to be transformed into your image and into your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Sure, yeah. No, we'll keep going. We spent so much time getting ready for the convention and uh, it's been so great. And um, and we're just gonna keep worshiping.
together by your mercy. We are united by your grace. We are so grateful to be gathered here in your name. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. brain is yogurt. I don't know what's happening. I promise we've done this before. Yeah, it's been a week. All right. Um, I'm going to be giving some announcements about just 
convention things, and then we're going to switch, and he's going to put on his pastor hat and give some announcements about Turner Christian Church things. Um, we are so excited that there's food after this. There's a potluck and jubilee hall after our church service closing session, so feel free to join us for that. If you still have your keys, please turn those in. Um, Sue's going to be around and she'll be in the back uh, back in the tab give her give her the keys um, don't forget to pay your tab in the back of the tabernacle that can be confusing um, make sure that you're all paid up on on your food tab and on your housing also on the chairs where we have the um, communion elements, once again, we have those volunteer sheets for the convention for 2024. If you're interested in serving in any part of this, I, I really think one of the best parts of being presidents this year was getting to interact with the volunteers. It's so fun. It is so fun to volunteer for this event. So if you're interested, grab one of those and um, let us know how you want to be interested, how you want to be involved in next year's convention. Your turn. All right. Welcome to Turner Christian Church. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with the convention as well, but it's, I'm excited. All right. Anyway, uh, so announcements for uh, the church. First of all, a kind of a fun note to start on that I, I acknowledge that Grace Brown is here. So please make sure that you say hi to her. Um, and somewhere around, hiding around here, probably in the back, is uh, Jack Holvey. Where's Jack? Oh, there he is. Jack Holvey. So... Make sure you say hi to Jack. Um, a note on the communion, if you didn't hear, or on the offering, if you didn't hear earlier, that unless otherwise marked, the offering will go to the Northwest Christian Network, which is a very good cause to support. So if you want to offer to the church, make sure you either mark it clearly or you give it at a later time to the church. Um, one other announcement that is bittersweet, but in a way uh, joyous, is that um, our sister Bonnie Rustin has gone to be with the Lord, and um, and so her service will be coming up. Um, we're finalizing the details, but please stay tuned for um, for that information. But just know that um, she went peacefully and with her family around her, and it was a it was a powerful moment. Um, any other? Oh, uh, you may also have noticed that the church app went dead yesterday, and it's going to stay that way because Faith Life is no longer doing church apps, but there is a new church app, and if you want to play with it before it's completely filled out, you can go to the app store and search for Turner Christian Church, and there is now a Turner Christian Church app. It's uh, functional. You can find information on there, and eventually we'll have it filled out with uh, sermons to listen, all the sermons to listen to, all the groups we'll be able to chat on there. It'll have lots of features. Right now, it's got the basics, but we'll be rolling that out in the future. And Jerry, what am I missing? Rachel, what am I missing? I'm going to go home and sleep for a couple of days. I just want you to know they both went like this. So they're just as yogurt as we are. So. Those are the announcements, which means that it is now um, my opportunity to welcome up Gary Shear from the Solomon Foundation. Gary was very uh, generous to come and present a workshop during our Church Challenges Day on how churches can move forward in times when the budget is in the red. He is part of the Solomon Foundation, which is a foundation that works with um, churches. And, and funny, he's going to, I'll let him tell you what the Solomon Foundation does, but he's going to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about the ministry they do. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. The Solomon Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit ministry. But how is it a ministry in that we have, we talk about investments and savings and we talk about loans with churches? How is that a ministry? The core values of Solomon tell you how it is a ministry. Number one core value is to honor God. Number two core value is to help people know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do you know of any other financial entity that has those two core values? We haven't found it. Number three core value is that we want to see people, uh, we want to provide the best interest rate possible to each investor, whether it's a church or whether it's an individual. And that is found in this rate sheet. I'd like each of you to get one of these. Number four core value is to help churches take the next step. 
We have accomplished that over the last 12 years, helping churches deal with how do they build a building, buy property, any kind of financial need that they have and need of a loan. We have started with half a million dollars. Today, the Solomon Foundation stands at one billion in total assets. Now, core value number five is to have fun. And when you're doing the first four, you are having fun. Now, that one billion is not the key number. The key number is this. Over 500 churches have been helped to expand their ministry. And as a result, from the time we close the loans, we count data. 65 plus thousand people have been baptized into Christ in the churches that we have made loans to. Solomon is a ministry. And it works like this. Churches have excess cash and they need to invest it someplace. They can put it at the Solomon Foundation, earn anywhere from 2.85 all the way to 4.85. An individual can do the same. You can do it with an IRA. You can do it with custodial accounts. It's all explained here. The principle is kingdom people, and we're gathered, have kingdom money. With Solomon, you have a kingdom impact. You will change lives of people that you don't even know. Now, you might find a better rate in the marketplace, but you'll never find a better result than investing with the Solomon Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. This week has been so full and so rich and so wonderful. And I know I didn't even get to experience half of the wonderful content that we had here at the convention. I feel like I do have a whole new vocabulary for being the church. I'm so glad that I have a year until next year's convention because that's how long it's going to take me to process all of the things we learned this week. One of the major themes that we were excited to focus on this year and offer folks at the convention was an opportunity to biblically address conflict in their lives. Conflict in their marriages, conflict in their churches, conflict in any relationship. We had Doug Marshall from Pastor Serve give a workshop on, yes, uh huh, who clapped? Yes, give a workshop on recognizing conflict as a direct source of real discipleship rather than an obstacle to discipleship. We also had Andrew Arthur from Genesis Christian Mediation give a workshop on how important it is to communicate well through conflict. There was just a whole lot of conflict and I've never been so excited about conflict, but I learned a lot. One of the catchphrases that I learned from Doug Marshall this week really got the wheels turning up here and I'm gonna chew, I'm gonna be chewing on it for a while. It's conflict stewardship. And that's how conflict has worked its way into my offering meditation because so much of what I learned this week comes back to stewardship. If you're not familiar with the term stewardship, it's a little bit of a fancy word, but it basically means being responsible about what you have and what you give. Knowing how much is too much to give and knowing when you're keeping more for yourself than you actually need. And I've just barely begun to tap this geyser in my brain of how to start pinpointing the parts of my life that deserve proper stewardship. Let me just share a couple of them with you. I already told you I'm really hooked on conflict stewardship. Giving conflict the proper amount of energy and attention and making sure that glorifying God in the resolution process holds more priority than achieving a resolution that I want. Stewardship of our gifts and our talents, using our gifts to the glory of God in a responsible way that doesn't make us grumpy around our kids or our spouse, in a way that doesn't interfere with the day-to-day -day calling to provide for the people who need us. Relational stewardship. If you're an extrovert like me, you know that sometimes you can find yourself with 101 friends that are all good friends, but no, nobody is a ride or die, call in the middle of the night, hug you when you're ugly crying, friend. 
home stewardship. People have asked Matthew and I this week, are you done having kids? Yes. <laughs> Our home is open. This is closed. <laughs> Even in our willingness to open our hearts and our home to whatever God has for us, we have to keep in mind that we only have a three bedroom. At this exact moment, our three kids are really young and at their most impressionable. Foster parenting, hospitality, these are good things that Christians should carefully and prayerfully practice, but not to the neglect of the home they already have. That's stewardship. These are just a few of the different kinds of stewardship that have been rolling through my mind this week. And as we prepare to collect our offering now, I want to invite you to identify an area of your life that deserves some extra stewardship attention. Meditate on how you're using the things in your life. It could be your marriage, your car, your kitchen table, your education, your CrossFit membership, your sobriety. Money and time are important things that God gives us to use for building his kingdom. But if we're honest about our commitment to being the church, then stewardship has to be something that covers every single aspect of our lives. So use this time as the buckets are passed to identify something in your heart or something in your house. And I'm going to pray right now that we commit to trying. Committing to success is impossible. Let's just commit to trying to be better stewards of what we've been given. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us all so much. If we tried to count them, we would never stop counting. Thank you for the gifts, for the talents, for the homes, for the relationships, for the money, for the tools, for the jobs, for the friends. Help us identify what needs special stewardship attention and give us the perseverance to be stewards. Give us the perseverance to keep trying to use it well. Show us how to use what you have given us well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's time to invite Annalie up. And this is, this is a big deal, guys. Most of you um, who know, An if you know Annalie, you've probably known her longer than I have. But um, I have been so excited for this message since we asked her. It was the easiest ask in the world. Annalie is a child of, the you're good, sorry. <laughs> Annalie's a child of the convention. She's been here her whole life, and she's a phenomenal student and a, and a wonderful preacher, and I, I'm so stoked to hear you bring the word, sister. Please welcome Annalie McIntosh to the pulpit. Hello. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Matt and Casey, um, for asking me to come. Um, I'm really honored and kind of feel like it's the twilight zone <laughs> right now to actually be up here. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, so my name is Annalie McIntosh. Um, I just graduated from Bushnell University about a little over a month ago now. And I am starting at Emmanuel in the fall of this year. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I also um, just completed my first unit of chaplaincy training at the hospital. 
um, which was a really cool experience. And I wanted to tell you all that because that kind of comes up in the message. Um, but Matt gave me a very broad topic. So he told me, he said, you can choose anything in all of Ephesians to focus on. And I thought, okay. And then he told me, he said, well, they're all going through all the pastors. Um, I mean, all the people who are coming to speak, sorry, are going through each chapter of the book of Ephesians, but you can choose anything that you want. And I thought, okay, well, that's kind of an overwhelmingly big ask, you know, choosing something. Um, But as I was like thinking and trying to decide, I was really drawn to the prayer to the Ephesians in Ephesians 3. And if you've been here for the week of convention, we've been saying that at the end of every evening session um, together. So you probably all haven't memorized, but I'm going to read it aloud for us now. So, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. So as I was reading that, I was really drawn to verses 17 and 18, which is what we're going to focus on today. And I'm going to read those verses out loud one more time. And those say... And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So this week I was reflecting in my own life and then also hearing different people talk and something, a common theme that kept coming up for myself and what I was seeing from other people was this guilt that we hold for not loving people well, for not showing people the love of Christ well, and looking back on our lives, on our ministry, and just holding and containing this sense of guilt for the things we've done with not effectively showing love to people. And as I was reading this verse, I was really confronted with the truth of what it says. What it says here is how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Our own experiences, um, our own responses to it, our own way of living out the love of Christ doesn't take away from the fact that it is here and alive and there and we are not in control of the love of Christ. The scripture doesn't say how wide and long and deep is the love of Christ if we do everything perfectly if we say all the right things, if we are perfect in our ministries, it's not dependable on anything that we say or do or accomplish. The love of Christ is here and alive. It's whether we choose to acknowledge it or to go into its depths, it is there. Despite our mistakes, despite our mistakes in ministry, it is there. And praise God, it's not something we create because I would be terrible if the love of Christ only came when I walked into the room. Like, how that would not go well. And something that I was reflecting on as I was thinking about this. So I told you all that I um, was a chaplain intern at the hospital. I got my first unit of chaplaincy training. And one of the things that we do in that is that we're on call overnight. One night a week, we're on call. And it's a very... Has anyone done, like, chaplaincy units before? Can I see a little hand just to see? Okay, a couple couple of you guys. Okay, so you know the drill a little bit with it. Um, So, basically, you get calls in the middle of the night, and you go. And there was one night in particular, it was 2 a.m., and I got a call. And I'm getting ready, and I'm tired, and I'm getting my clothes on, and I'm heading out, and I'm like, okay... Well, I'm going and I'm bringing the love of Christ with me into this hospital room. 
You know, that's what I'm coming in and I'm bringing. And I start driving over to the hospital. No one's on the road at 2 a.m. really in Eugene, just an FYI, if you ever want to drive at that time. No one's there, you know, dead quiet. And I'm thinking, okay, no one is here. Like I'm coming, I'm bringing the love of Christ to this room. Like that's what I am doing. And then something interesting happened. I go into this room and the love of Christ is already there. It's in the room already. It's filling the room, the nurses, the doctors, the people. It is so tangible. If I hadn't come, it would have been there just as strong. I did nothing. It was there. And as I was driving back home from this, I thought, oh my goodness, the love of Christ is so alive and here and nothing can prevent that or make it be more so. It's so there. And in this moment when I drove back home, the contrast of when I drove to the hospital and I felt this sense of, um, you know, I'm the one bringing it. When I drove back home, I felt this sense of, gosh, the Lord is here in this moment. And I wrote this poem. It's, I wrote it at 2 a.m., so don't, you know, be too judgmental with the contents. But in this moment, this thought came to me. In the darkness, the Lord is with me. The moon does not shine just because people are looking at it. The train does not blow its horn because people are watching. The Lord is here, radically and fully here in the depths of the night, just as vibrant as the moon shining in the sky with no one looking. The Lord is here, shining and whole, fully present in the depths. How good it is to never be alone, to be fully with the Lord in all things. For the Lord is in all things. He does not need to be acknowledged for that to be true. As I feel alone, I see the moon. Overwhelm overtakes me as I realize I see God too, present in there, whole and true. In my lifted heart, the train starts blowing its horn, and I'm lifted even more in joy. It's as though the Lord is saying, I am here. I always have been here. I am fully here whether you choose to look at me or not. I am fully with you and always will be. The night is never really empty and you are never alone. Look, I am here. So it's in the middle of the night. It's in the hospital rooms. It's in the suffering. It's in the joy. It is so utterly here with us. Just as the passage says, how deep is the love of Christ? When we get to be and have the opportunity to be rooted in it, but like we just said, we are not it. The love of Christ is wide and long and high and deep, and it is powerful. But what causes us to not be able to understand the fullness of this love? The verse answers this as well when it says that we may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. When we don't do it together with all the Lord's holy people, we get a limited idea of the depthness of the love of God. And as I was thinking about this, it made me think of if someone was wanting to compose a beautiful song for an orchestra to play, just this beautiful, beautiful thing, but they said, but we don't want the violins in there. We don't believe the violins belong in the orchestra, so we'll make a beautiful song, but no violins and, you know what, no upright bass either. We don't really get along with them. So we have that, and then what? the other example that came to my mind is painting a beautiful painting, and you're wanting to make the most beautiful painting in the world, but you refuse to use red and blue because you don't like the colors, you don't agree with them. So the orchestra composition becomes incomplete, right? You're missing something. The painting is missing something, and neither become the depths of what it could have been if you had included the red and the blue and the upright bass and the violins. You have a limited perception of the vibrancy of the love and the depth of God. And how much more beautiful are the Lord's people than these things? How much more beautiful are this denomination or this idea or this thought than a violin? The vibrancy of those who love the Lord belong in the picture, in the orchestra composition. The love of God is wide, long, deep, and high. 
And together with the Lord's people, we can begin grasping this depth in us because we can begin seeing this depth in us truly with all the colors and all the instruments. We can begin putting the full colors to the painting, the full orchestration to the symphony. So the question becomes, which instruments, which paint, which people are we not willing to include in this? What are the people that we don't want to be in community with, in participation with? I recently preached at a church and the, I was talking with someone about the experience and the pastor of the church I preached has a very specific theological view of something. And I was talking to this person about that and the person told me, they said, well, there's no room at God's table for those people. And I was sitting there going, what? These people have been serving the community. They've been loving the community. They have been there in the community. And you have the audacity to say there's no room at the Lord's table for them? It's like, what? And I do the same thing, whether I use those words or not. There's people and there's ideas where we go, there's just no room. There's room for this, there's room for that, but there's no room for you. But how much more do we learn about the Lord when we see him in every family and in every people? So who do you believe are not allowed to experience the depths? Who do you believe are basically not the Lord's people who are supposed to be in this community with? Are you actually open to being around people who think differently than you? Or do you feel that some theology is just so corrupt that the love of God doesn't dwell among those people at all? Do you feel like the breadth of the love of God, of God's transforming power, stops when it reaches that people group? A certain denomination or a certain theological idea somehow making the love of God deep enough for whatever you have done, whatever you have experienced, or whatever you believe but not deep enough for them. Deep enough for you, but not deep enough for them. And William Barclay has a beautiful reflection on this. He says, if we wish to work this out, we might say that in the breadth of its sweep, the love of Christ includes every man of every kind and every age and every world. In the length to which you would go, the love of Christ was obedient unto death and accepted even the cross. In its depth, it descended to make it, sorry about that. In its depth, it descended to experience even death. In its height, he still loves us in heaven where he still he sits to ever liveth and make intercession for us. There is no man who is outside the love of Christ. There is no place which is out of the reach of Christ. There is no experience which the love of Christ will refuse in order to gain one man. It is a love which passes knowledge and which, if he accepts it, will fill a man with nothing less than the life of God himself. So it's every man from every world, from every direction. And God can reach down and touch all of us and is reaching down and touching all of us. There's no limits on how wide and how long and how deep and how high the love of Christ is. And we get to experience that in community with one another. But this is a hard thing to actually do in our own lives. And I just did a little kind of three different steps of maybe how we can go about doing this or at least a start um, of some encouragement and then what you can do. And the first piece of encouragement I want to give is that we can do this. We can experience the love of God with all people because you've done it all week. You've already done it for a week. You've been with people who you may disagree with theologically, and you've been in community with them, people who have different beliefs on things, people who live different lifestyles than you. We've been watching these victory videos, and we've been applauding and cheering, and guess what? Their churches may have totally different beliefs than you do, and we're over here cheering for them. That's a good thing, and that's something that shows that we can do this. We can carry this spirit with us as we go from convention and celebrate the victories of the churches. And after we realize that we can, 
The next step is to realize, well, who are the people that we are viewing as though the, the love of God doesn't descend to them, as though we can't communicate with them. The violins and the reds and the blues we don't want in our pictures. And what helps me when I'm trying to figure out who this is in my life is just thinking, well, who am I making bad jokes about? You know, who are the people who are like the butt of the jokes, who I'm making crass comments about? Or it could be people you just roll your eyes towards. You're like, gosh, you know, here they are again doing this thing. Another thing that is helpful to me in discerning this is who's the villain? Who's your villain in your head when you're thinking of the people you don't want to be in relationship with in the church? Recognize that and figure out who these people are for you so that it's not just an abstract idea that sounds nice, but actually people you can visualize in your head. Because together, we can actually experience the depthness, the highness, the lawness of the love of Christ. And we need to see Christ in each other, even the villains and even the butts of our joke and all of that. And lastly, the third thing that that I was reflecting on was the fact that this is a prayer to the Ephesians. And it's a prayer that we can have in our own life as we're trying to go about loving people. So we now know that we can, we've done it all week, and we now know, or we're thinking, okay, who are these people? And the third gift of this this, um, chapter of Ephesians, these couple of verses, is that we can now pray it to the Lord. And the prayer that can, you can make it be your own, but I pray that I may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that I may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Lord, break the thoughts that prevent me from doing this. We can pray this every day to try to begin to bond and to grow together, to experience the depths and the vastness of God's love in one another. And with the Lord's holy people and this knowledge, we can begin grasping the depths and dimensions of Christ's love and live it out with all the Lord's holy people. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this week that we've been together, that we've been able to live out this community, God, with one another, whether we agree with each other or not, that we're able to experience the vastness of your love, God, because it is high and it is deep and it is everywhere and it is so tangibly here, so tangibly in the hospitals, in the prisons, in our homes. It is so tangibly everywhere, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that we realize that and that we give ourselves grace to know that the depthness and the love of God is just so alive and everywhere, and that we can experience this with one another in true community. And I pray that we take that out to our own communities, God, and trust that your love is so high and so wide and so long and so, so good, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I encourage you, if you would, to uh, take the communion elements here and If you're like me and it takes you a long time to get these open, you can get started on that early. I want to encourage you, uh, if you are willing, to hold the bread in one of your hands and to hold the cup in your other hand uh, until the time when we partake together. Well, it is the final time of communion that we have uh, this week uh, as part of the Northwest Christian Convention, the Oregon Christian Convention, and uh, I feel a pressure uh, to really see 
the communion observance as a special thing, but I'm actually going to do kind of the opposite by going to the Gospel of Luke and sort of taking us behind the curtain a little bit to a moment when the communion celebration sort of went off the tracks in the original communion celebration. So we see in Luke 22, verses 14 uh, through 24, this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And if you, if you hear those words of Jesus, you can almost hear him just saying to his disciples, this is supposed to be a really special moment. And so after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. I mean, a penultimate moment here. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I mean, that is, it, it's, it's so huge. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. With each thing that Jesus says, I mean, he's just letting his disciples know how monumental what he is about to do for them is. But then he says this, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And then in verse 23 and 24, we see their reaction to this monumental moment of Jesus. They began to question among themselves, which of them it might be who would do this. They're looking around. And then verse 24 is the low moment. At the Lord's table, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Oh no. Jesus has, has said to his closest followers, man, I, I'm giving everything for you and I want you to participate in my sacrifice. I want you to be with me through it all. And their response is, who's he talking about who's going to betray him? Man, I wonder if I'm the top dog, number one ranked disciple. Here's the thing. Jesus' moment of, of intimacy with his closest followers descends into a time where they're looking around at each other, playing the comparison game, and trying to win the trophy. Jesus' eyes are on the prize that is the cross, that is the sacrifice for them, that is the eternal life that he's paying for with his, his body and his blood that's given for them. And their eyes are on the prize of where they stand in the rankings. One of my favorite old hymns is The Old Rugged Cross. Anybody like that song? I love that song. But I do have one bone to pick with whoever it was that wrote it. And it's this. I think there's a picture in the old rugged cross that is kind of like, I'm going to cherish the old rugged cross and cling to the old rugged cross all the way through my life until I get to the end of my life. And then at, the, at that point, my trophies at last, I'll lay down. But here's the reality. I don't cling very well to a cross if I've got a trophy or trophies in my hand. I need to lay my trophies down if I'm gonna to cling to the old rugged cross. I need to lay my trophies down if I'm going to hold the body of Jesus given for me in one hand and the cup of Jesus, his blood shed for me in the other hand. If you look around you today, you can play a comparison game. I'll tell you a secret about the person sitting next to you. Spiritually, the person sitting next to you was so messed up, was so bad, was so impoverished that it would actually take someone giving their life 
to pay the price for the awful things that they've done. Imagine the kind of things the person sitting next to you has done, and I tell you what, you're not even scratching the surface. It's even worse than that. Spiritually, they couldn't even scrounge up enough to go down to the convenience store and buy themselves a lottery ticket. But spiritually, someone gave it to them and they won the jackpot. The person sitting next to you has incomparable riches in Christ Jesus. They went from being desperately poor, hopeless, dead in Christ, we're told, to having all the riches of heaven and earth. And you know whose story is the same as theirs? You and the people around the world today who are taking the bread and the cup together with us and the cloud of witnesses that we can feel in a place like this, in a setting like this, all of us, hopeless, as for you, as for them, dead in your transgressions and sins, except that God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Put your trophy down this morning and look at the real trophy. Look at the cross. Look at the sacrifice of Jesus and look at the victory that was won for you and me. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful to you, Lord, that we can lay our trophies down because no trophy we've ever earned means anything in light of the cost that it took to redeem us from death, from the pit. And that doesn't compare to the incomparable riches, the depth and the height and the, the, the width of the love of God that surpasses anything that we could ask or imagine. Lord, as we take this bread today and this cup, we ask that we would just get it right for a moment and let it be about you and about the love that you've given to us that we get to share with the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you take the bread and the cup, we'll prepare for our final song that we'll sing together. That meditation was an excellent lead into our um, closing song as we cling to the cross, as we cling to Jesus. The core of everything we've talked about this throughout this week and the core of everything we talk about every time we gather and everything we do as Christians is Jesus. And so I invite you as you finish taking the elements to stand with us for our closing hymn as we, uh, as we call on Jesus and we call on the core of everything we do.
Dear Father, you are the one that we need. Your son is the one that we need. We thank you for your presence here this week. And we thank you for your presence here for the last 171 years and for the next 171 years. And as we move forward into our benediction and we claim your words and the words that we just heard preached, we pray that you would um, keep them fresh in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing. For those of you who have not been with us this week, we have been saying the prayer uh, of Ephesians 3 as our benediction. And so we'll encourage you to uh, follow along on the slides as we claim this prayer of scripture together. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, now to, to him, him who is, is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. After we close, you're invited to join us for a potluck in Jubilee, where we'll take the food that is left over, and any of you are camping and want to contribute something, we'll all eat together, and then we'll be working to get things back in order and get packed up and cleaned up and moved out. So you're all invited to join us for that. I think that's everything. So it's time. Um, I will, for the convention, I officially declare the 23 convention, the 171st Northwest Christian Convention adjourned. May you all stay healthy, stay hopeful, and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.